Good morning, good morning. This is the sixth episode of Fafo and Chill, in which the Chainstack Developer Experience team talks about the various things that we've been building and exploring within Web3 over the past few weeks. In classic Web3 fashion, we spend a lot of time exploring new Web3 technologies and building various tools. Fafo and Chill is where we talk about these things and dive into the world of Web3 tech. As usual, um, we usually have about three speakers here. Uh, David is actually his birthday today, so he's not here. So today it's just uh, myself and Ake. Um, my name is Ethan. My alias is Tabasco. I am the uh, developer relations lead here at Chainstack, and Ake is our director of developer experience, um, which is actually very closely related to our topic today. You know, over the past few weeks and few months, even throughout the Web3 industry, this single term keeps popping up throughout large organizations and medium sized organizations, especially those that face developers. And this term is developer experience. So, you, you know, we see this term all the time. Developer experience, this, you know, like we're, we're working on developer experience and we're working on DevX and developer relations and developer advocacy. And I think what's important, what we're going to try to define today and kind of create a picture for is exactly what developer experience is and the role that it plays within an organization. Um, and specifically what we've created within Chainstack for developer experience. Of course, Chainstack, I think, is a pretty decent example, seeing as, you know, we're an infrastructure provider. So uh, our audience is exclusively developers. So developer experience for us. Um, has a very interesting way that we kind of move around things and, and uh, you know, responsibility and stuff like that. Um, so that'll be the topic for today. We're going to dive into developer experience as a broad term, talk about developer relations, um, maybe even how that, differ that differs from developer advocates. It's, you know, sometimes a little bit hard to define. Um, so it should be an interesting topic. Uh, you know, I actually talked a little bit about this on the interview with a crypto jobs list not too long ago, we did a whole segment on exactly what developer relations is and, you know, how it fits into the ecosystem and uh, the specific responsibility. So maybe we can talk a little bit about that as well. Um, but I guess to start, uh, Ake, uh, you know, as the director of developer experience at Chainstack, I think it'd be interesting to first hear maybe loosely from a high level, you know, may maybe, ex you know, like we're explaining it to potentially somebody who's never heard of the term before, you know, what de developer experience is fundamentally and the role that it has within the organization, like where it's placed in the organization, stuff like that. Maybe you want to start with a quick overview. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, yeah. Thanks, Ethan. It's a good topic. And uh, by the way, you guys should check it check it out. The Crypto Jobs List interview with Ethan is really, really insightful and entertaining as well. So we're gonna link it down below. Uh, check the link. Uh, as for the developer experience, uh, so I think for the past uh, few years. In, in Web3, certainly for the past couple of years, there's been this FOMO, FOMO into the developer experience. In, in typical, typical FOMO fashion, uh, you know, if you guys been in, into in, in Web3, is uh, I think the ge the general feeling is uh, everybody needs, fo you know, everybody's FOMO into developer experience, we need developer relations, we need developer advocates. What are they going to do is kind of the second question. First, you need to acquire them. Uh, you know, say, same as with buying coins, you just fall into something and then you, you, you know, because everybody's doing this and they need to figure it out. And everybody kind of understands that you need the developer experience, but nobody, you know, a lot of, Ethan specifically here talked to a lot of organizations uh, in doing the, you know, developer relations metrics uh, and measurements. And I think the general feeling is everybody has their kind of own idea, but not like, not very clear idea at the same time. Uh, and the, the first thing you're going to hear when you get developer experience mentioned is very, very difficult to measure, which is, you know, kind of true, but at the same time, uh, not really, but in general, in general, uh, I don't, I don't think I have a firm definition of what developer experience is, but the thing is you need to be able to communicate with the developers and overall in general, the kind of the North Star uh, for this organization uh, within your company is to be bringing in revenue for sure, right? Or contribution to bringing in the revenue. So that that's something that, that everybody needs to keep in mind because it, it's very, very easy to kind of, uh, you know, go straight to, to kind of <clears throat> Uh, veer off the path of the revenue or, or you know the 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 activity because when you start drilling into like the things that the, the developer advocates and developer developer relations guys do <clears throat> it's very 
it's very easy to start fixing uh, things that would make the life of the developers easier, which is a good thing, of course, uh, obviously. But, you know, sometimes you can get into the details that don't matter as much that makes, you know, the, they don't, they don't leverage, uh, the experience that you have and th that can, you know, make the, 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 the company, the organization bigger, right? Cause you, you don't need to do every little thing. Uh, you, you, you mostly need to do things that matter, uh, specifically when you, uh, when, you know, when you're lean, if you want to be lean as a company, but that's, uh, that's kind of very vague answer. Uh, but looking into every organization, Web3 or even Web2, when you do developer experience, it's very, very, I think it's very, very easy to, to build a, uh, an organization within the company to align with the goals that the company has. There are, uh, on, 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 overall, I think there are, there are three different types, uh, out there of the, of the organizations where the developer experience overall is kind of similar, but also a little bit uh significantly enough different so that we can talk about this and this is the three types of companies that exist today i believe one is proprietary fully fully proprietary uh or almost fully proprietary company two is open source and three is uh web3 right so for a full like proprietary company web2 type of company this is where the developer experience and uh, started in general. I think Microsoft was one of the first ones uh, where, you know, the, the famous thing, developers, 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 the famous meme uh, came about, came around from that. And they used, I think they used to, even in the 90s, uh, if I'm not wrong, they used to travel around the US uh, and just talking to developers and boarding developers. <clears throat> Uh, into Microsoft products to, uh, and they, they kind of early on recognized that the, the, the developers are the guys, are the people, you know, you need to be able to talk to and not everybody can talk to them, right? Uh, something we can talk about, about laser and something that, that is, I'm just being chaotic, uh, but you know, whatever, this is a chill, chill, chill podcast. So, uh, and something that is surprisingly, uh, Web3 doesn't fully realize uh, yet. I'm going to mention this later. But first, proprietary. It's very, very easy with proprietary companies because all the, or like 80% of the knowledge uh, that you have in how to operate a proprietary product that is closed source can only come from your, you know, from the company. So all the people uh, outside of the company that you want to be using your product that you talk to is a developer, you know, experienced developer relations, developer advocate, uh, evangelist. The, some of them used to be called evangelists. Uh, can all, th this knowledge can only come from you, in, you know, and th then, then it's kind of easy to, uh, to define this uh, role because you're the only person out there who is capable of talking to and onboarding developers. Then there is open source, right? Open source changes changes things, um, and then you know, and and then then it, th this is kind of uh, a little bit kind of interim. I can't believe I'm saying this. Uh, open source guys would disagree. But it's kind of interim phase uh, between uh, to me at least between proprietary and Web three. And for open source is, you know, the metrics are a little bit different. You, you can do it. So you pour in a lot of money, uh, or quite a bit of money into your developer experience guys. So that they, they can do, they make your free product, your free product adopted more. You know, you, yeah, uh, you talk to, uh, you talk to customers, you talk to prospects, you engage, you, ca you, you know, you engage with the uh, communities of developers, uh, for example, uh, you know, so that they can contribute uh, to your product and they can, uh, you know, get your product, for example, you know, go on GitHub and just start implementing your stuff within their organization. Uh, and you can be, build a bunch of metrics around this, like activity, GitHub stars or whatever. 
uh, and, and then through this, uh, which you know, which is kind of making things uh, a little a little bit uh, not murkier, but kind of you know a little bit more uh, opaque in 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 in, uh, in how the developer experience is contributing. But at the same time, the developer experience is kind of thing in, in open source, it becomes even uh, more of a, of a significant, you know, uh, of a significant thing that that, uh, that propels their company forward. So like in proprietary, it's very easy. The more developers you get signed up uh, on your platform, the more developers you, you, you get to, to start using the product, the more revenue you get. When you move into the open source uh, business models, uh, which I think are kind of more difficult to maintain than you get that then the the uh, relation of your of the stuff that you do to the value of the company becomes you know less direct but I, uh, but, but because you get other people to use your product for free you kind of build in this network of developers who are using your product I think it becomes more impactful um, and to give you an example, for example, you, you say, you, for example, you have a database. Uh, you have an open source database uh, that uh, that you know is better than the proprietary ones, or you know the ones that developed by like other companies, or you're competing with other uh, open source databases. And then you you kind of have this uh, under some sort of a license uh, being used by other developers uh you know free kind of walk in they can walk in and just start using your yeah, install your db and start start using it and you get no revenue out of this but the moment they want to move it to like high you know workload production is when the um, you know is when the, your company engages uh kind of you know professional services offering uh, and things like that, where you start getting revenue, and if your big customer start, starts using you, you get, you know, bigger revelation of your company. Uh, and basic, basically, the more you know, the more companies out there, and the bigger, high, higher value companies out there are using your your database, the more professional services uh, you would sell, the more revelation you would get. But the uh, relation of the stuff that you do as developer experience person to to get this spread uh, through developers uh, of your solution, which is open source and free, to, to the moment they, they will start paying you uh, the company for professional services, which is not going to be the developer experience guide, by the way. Uh, it's, you know, the, 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 the kind of the, the period in time uh, or the road to get there is longer, but it's more you know, it's 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 a kind of more significant one, it's a more significant one, and then and then you get you go Web three, right? From there you go Web three, and <clears throat> the uh, relation is kind of even more, uh, you know, e even even more even less transparent, probably, but even more more important because uh, there is direct financial financial stuff involved. In most of the projects uh, where you get the tokenomics, the tokenomics and all the stuff, and you start employing metrics like, you know, you can be creative. Uh, you, you can get uh, like on-chain metrics, users, contract deployments, value transfer, and all the stuff. But you want to get your, or you know, tools like uh, Ethan's report here uh, that that we already discussed um, on the previous episodes. But you get. Th those metrics uh, that will that, that's kind of always obvious um, that the more developers you onboard into into your ecosystem into your protocol uh, you know the, the more value you'd get but 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 to measure this uh, and because you're giving everything out for, for free uh, it becomes more you know more difficult because you're not going to be selling uh, professional services for example, for your protocol, but some other company might, right? Some other company probably will. Uh, uh, but you yourself, your, your model is even more different to that of the open source. So I think it's it's kind of more transparent or like easier and maybe less impactful in a way uh, in a proprietary company 
more impactful and you know less not, not as easy uh in open source so, so you know there is a degree of being even less easy than the open source uh and but more impact for impactful uh in web3 so that's my very kind of rambling take uh uh on this uh but it, but, but 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 that that's what makes it fun that uh, that's what makes it fun but and also uh something else is to uh to to give to give an example and i'm sure most of you guys guys know this whenever you go to an event it's something that that, that uh some of the companies haven't caught up to yet or they don't care i don't know but you go to events uh, there are booths and you want to speak to, you know, you want to talk to people. Uh, and there are typically at least 50%, 60% or maybe 70% of them, of, of the company representatives at, at the booths or just people running around are not technical, are not technical enough. Uh, and this is, you know, this immediately kind of makes it uh, difficult uh, for the company sending the non-technical representative out there to kind of an obstacle to be onboarding users or developers to to your product. Yeah, and it, that's, uh, uh, you know, the maybe, maybe the perfect, uh, the perfect kind of uh, way, way to attack, to, to do this would be uh, having a, a BD uh, any developer experience person who knows how to talk to developers, right? Uh, and uh, and BD, B B2D, B2D, business development is usually very, very... For the longest time, it was considered to be very difficult because uh, everybody knew you're, you're, you need to be talking to developers, but uh, nobody kind of really knows how to, how to do this. And then there is a big... Uh, kind of stretch or a gap from say founder, a person or a builder who, who's building a product. Uh, and then from this builds product, you kind of need to reach your target audience, which is a developer in our case. And, and it goes through, you know, and there are multiple people uh, on the way in there. There is uh, like a founder, a chief technical officer or CTO, uh, they build this product and there is engineering implementing their own stuff and hooks and, you know, and whatever things to, to make it work. Uh, and then there is, uh, a, and, and from there, this is kind of where it enters, I think, the, the real model developer experience guys. Because then there is sales guys, there is SDRs, there is marketing, uh, there is, you know, uh, like support and whatever. But to kind of bridge the gap, bridge this gap from the product to uh, where the you know the the people in your company uh, like like SDRs and sales and support guys uh, and technical writers will feel supported, supported, and not only that, but uh, they will all know what is the place of this product in 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 this industry that we are in. You know, who's the target customer? Who's the you know, was was the customer profile, and <clears throat> just being able to talk to somebody who is not uh, the city or 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 the engineering. In, in a lot of cases, engineering uh, they have a very focused, one-sided view on things. But developer experience guys, in this sense, they are kind of the you know generalists that, that have a little bit of everything. And it makes them kind of whole and fun, and you know, and and this activity uh, fun as well. And the you know, so these are the people that have a bit of everything. The uh, they need, and it's very unique. It's very unique too. So the and obviously, like every developer experience person is this kind of spider. If you know, if you, if you look at the person uh, and the person's skills. In the spider chart kind of sense, you know, they have stronger and weaker, uh, you know, kind of uh, set, sets of skills that are required in this role <clears throat> in there. But they all have for sure, uh, for sure, a, a unique, a very unique set of skills 
uh, that's very useful today. So communication, right? Communication, technical knowledge, uh, understanding the market, uh, and you know, uh, and communication. I mean, not not just being presentable, but also being able to structure their thought, which is something I'm not doing right now, I guess. But but <laughs> whatever. And, uh, you know, and being able to talk to BDs, being able to talk to developers, being able to talk to, talk to sales, you know, kind of shifting between the, the, the levels of the of their technical uh, skill, you know, because uh, you need to kind of, when, when you're talking to not, non-developer guys, but you still need to get your point across, you shift the gear, right? And you talk, you kind of you do a different example uh and w when you talk to some like hardcore developers uh you talk in very specific terms and, and, and things uh and all of that and one one more important uh thing is this so t this today is july 2023 in this point in time the ability for people to build stuff uh, you know, and the number of people who can build stuff is accelerating. So, where you know the the the, the yeah the number is growing at at, at a more rapid uh, pace uh, than it did like 20 years ago. And then with all those like JavaScript libraries, it accelerated. Now with with AI, it's accelerating even more. And in this sense, a lot of people out out there they want to be create in Web three. Web three is helping this a lot. A lot because you have this open platform where you don't even need to to authenticate to access the you know the, the underlying DB. You can just write the transaction if you have some of the like base currents of the protocol and those stuff. Very trustless, very very easy to to interact with, very fun to interact with, and all of this. Uh, and you know there is a lot of tooling tooling built around. Uh, and my point is a lot uh, all, all of this stuff it, it makes people who want to be creative uh whereas in the past uh their their only outlet would be would probably be to, to start a blog and you know be or do like uh when the pl platformization started uh like go on reddit become an, you know sort of a person who is you know you know be a part of an online community uh and then you know youtube tiktok all of this stuff but you can also today it's it's a lot easier to be producing, uh, to be expressing your creative ways of, of doing stuff uh, in code. So there are a lot more developers out there of different levels. In developer experience, guys, today are the only people who can talk to them, right? Uh, developer experience, guys, in Web three, they can talk on the one hand, you know, to some very like at the edge of the even web three to people who completely anonymous you know monkey pfp whatever doing some some cool solidity contract and building the front end for or for it maybe not not to experience but just doing some you know like crazy like fun stuff maybe on some like zora network and then at the same time same developer person same developer experience guy, uh, guy on chain stack for sure they can go and talk to uh like uh the the guys building the Aragon uh client software which is supporting different uh event protocols and then they they are there'll be also the same people who would think how how would you you know to check out and decide uh or analyze the architecture of a bridge from an EVM protocol to Solana which is completely different right this this all encompassing stuff so this is what the developer experience guys do, and then uh, the the, the uh, organization itself, the developer experience organization. You can, as you as you, the more you do it, the more roles you explore, uh, and the more roles you you kind of figure out how to do hands on. You can then scale yourself out and to uh, and kind of pass the knowledge that you have. To, and make this a very specific role. Uh, to give you an example, you know, let, let's have like a, a developer experience person uh, who is capable of talking to projects, who is capable of building stuff, who is capable of 
um, talking to existing customers to you know reduce customer churn to make sure you can upsell to them uh, uh, and who can also produce the tutorial. All of these uh, kind of unique skills uh, that just described, which uh, you know every developer experience person, at least in Chainstack, uh, possesses. Uh, they are, you know, they are their own roles uh, when you start scaling uh, this. Uh, you get an account manager to be able to talk to customer and upsell. You get a technical account manager to be able to build a customer profile and understand their infrastructure and be able to talk to, you know, to their engineering. Uh, you, you can have a scout to just go out there and get and, and you know you know check out the projects that are out there and get kind of do the first approach to them uh you have a technical writer to to prepare uh you know product feature documentations and tutorials uh and you also have a product person uh you know where you can uh advise on the stuff that we need that we need to do based in your experience with the developers uh and uh and at the same time, understand, understand, not just have some crazy idea or just have an idea that the customers want, but understand in that this one, uh, th this like this particular feature will be easier to implement based on the current architecture of the product of the under the hood workings that we have compared to the other one, right? So that's a lot, uh, that, that's why the developer experience role is kind of the best and yeah. So that yeah. was my long, long winded take. You know, developer experience, I mean, like you mentioned, kind of everything that you said, it's extremely multifaceted. So there's a million components of a developer experience and you know, different things that make it a unique role. And I guess, you know, for me specifically, the reason why, and, you know, I guess to kind of quickly call back to the crypto jobs interview, we talked uh, for an hour basically about this topic. Um, about what developer experience is, specifically what developer relations is, which is different than developer advocates and technical writers and stuff like this. Um, but the reason why it's it's kind of such an interesting topic to me personally is because, you know, when I first joined Chainstack uh, a little over a year ago, um, when I joined developer relations at Chainstack, we didn't really know what it was. We hadn't yet answered the question that we we're answering today, which is what is developer relations, right? Organization wide, we didn't know what it was, basically. Because when I joined Chainstack, developer relations was an, an SDR role. That's it, it. That's basically what it was. There was no developer relations at the core of it. I mean, it was, you know, here's a list of projects. Go reach out to these guys and go try to get leads and pass them off to our account executives. And it, it was a decent way to produce value. But, you know, the interesting part about that was that, you know, you're hiring people that, like Egg mentioned, have a, a very generalized and wide range of skills, which is, uh, content creation and talking to people and communication and um, building things hands-on physically. I, I mean, there's a variety of things there. And then you're throwing them into a sales role, which only requires one or two of those skills, right? So like, you, you know, when you look at the way in which organizations are balanced and, and the different, you know, parts of an organization, you have sales, right? This is like most, at least in this case, I'm going to primarily go with the context of like SaaS, right? Or, or platform as a service or service, uh, you know, software as a service, um, which is kind of where Chainstack fits in. Um, so, you know, you have a sales team, people that are really great at communicating. They're probably less, you know, like apt on the uh, technical side of things, but they're great at like conveying ideas and convincing people. I mean, that's the whole point of sales, right? So you have sales team, they're really good at that one thing. You have a marketing team, which is really great at marketing and content creation and content distribution, right? Then you have uh, engineering and product, right? Which are really great at creating things and figuring out what the platform needs and what, you know, uh, creating tools and stuff like this. And then you have all these things, right? That that specify and focus on a single single vertical within the kind of a development stack of, of a, a software as a service company. And then on top of all these things, now you have developer experience, right? So this is something that we didn't realize until at least with in the context of developer relations, we hadn't realized this for a long time. For I mean, it took us probably six or seven months before we came to this conclusion of this is where it all fits together, and this is this is like how it all works. But you know, you have all these verticals, and you have developer experience. And developer experience takes some some sales, it takes some marketing, it takes some product, it takes some engineering, and generalizes that through people that have experienced all these things and and are actually active within the community. So. 
you know, the, the general, the way that I described it with the crypto jobs interview was that, you know, marketing people and salespeople, for example, right. Or communications people or PR people or whatever, these individuals and these teams aren't expected to be technical. That's not what they're hired for. That's not their, that's not their job, right? They shouldn't, they're not expected to know how to build an AI chatbot that sends transactions to the JSON RPC. And I, I mean, you know, these are things that are very specialized to a, a certain group of people in terms of like just building things generally. Um, so developer experience provides an alternative, right? So especially if you're in an organization that markets to developers and that interacts with developers like Chainstack is, then you need somebody to do additional marketing, to do additional communication, to in some cases do additional sales that has the context of developers that knows how, number one, uh, how developers think, you know, in terms of the things they need, things that they don't need, um, the technical side of things just as a foundation, right? So how everything fits together, how this works. Like, and I think probably one of the most important things is how does our product fit into the technical stack, which a lot of people don't, a lot of people within organizations um, because they're not as technical, maybe they don't have as a complete understanding as maybe somebody on developer experience where, you know, you take somebody on developer experience and, you know, you put them in a room of a bunch of people and say, do a presentation on, and, you know, Chainstack as an example, how Chainstack RPCs fit into the tech stack and, and why, you know, why you should choose the Chainstack global elastic node, right? Okay, so like it, if you put nine out of 10 people that are non-technical, even salespeople in a lot of cases, in this position and tell them to explain it to a group of developers, they can't do it because it requires skills that just you're not hiring those other parts of an organization for, right? So then that's where developer experience, this is the point of developer experience, is to bridge the gap, like like uh, I think that's the term that you used, between the lack of technical understanding in all these teams to create a team, right? One team that can do a little bit of everything, but with a technical, con uh, like a technical context, but beyond technical context, with context of developers as a community and as a people, right? So this is this is kind of the importance of developer experience and where it sits in. And you know, when I first joined about a year ago, like I mentioned, we started with sales role, and then you know it was interesting. We had to figure out the answer to this question: What is developer experience? What is developer relations? We had to figure this out ourselves um, over the course of of a year almost. You know where where we said, well, does this work, right? So we started with the sales role, and then we said, okay, well, and maybe this isn't quite developer relations. This doesn't really hit the definition of of what it's widely accepted as. So we say, okay, let's try to to have them do some Twitter Spaces, right? Like I think I, I was the first, um, one of the first developer relations guys to do Twitter Spaces because before that it was uh, mostly developer advocates, which I'll get into in a second in terms of the, the differences. It can get a little bit complicated with all the terminology and everything. Um, but you know, I started with the Twitter spaces, and then we realized that there's some value here, right? Going, sending somebody that's technical in to do Twitter spaces with the idea of evangelizing a product through technical context and through being able to, to kind of verbalize these different concepts in a way that's digestible for a larger group of people, um, which most people can't do, uh, most non-developer experience people can't do, right? So we, we uh, realized the value in that. We said, okay, so let's start doing Twitter spaces. And then, you know, as we kind of went down that kind of rabbit hole of, oh, let's do more of this, let's do more of this, eventually it's January, 2023. And we, we kind of uh, came up to a point where it's like, well, let's have developer relations at Chainstack be um, exclusively developer facing. And so what this means is that we're not doing sales. We're not going to like, you know, reach out to random projects and try to sell them with JSIC anymore. Instead, we're going to use developer relations as, as well, what the name means, right? Which is creating relationships with developers. Number one, that means creating content. So, uh, whether it's a Twitter thread or a video or a podcast or doing a Twitter space or a video interview or whatever, right? These are things that that are, are pieces of content that developers and technical audiences can consume and get value from that also provides value to the organization. That's number one. Number two is, of course, uh, direct relationship building. This is a, a huge part of it, right? Taking time, developer relations, infamously, and I'm really glad when I see uh, and I and encounter developer relations guys that have this down, is that you know if you have a question or especially in, in relation to a, a specific product offering, where you want to talk about a certain concept or something, then developer relations in most organizations will be the role that you reach out to for that, right? A big part of developer relations is the relations part of the word. It's connecting with people and, and discussing things and communicating, right? 
Um, so that's the other thing. And then there's a few other things like you can even get into like building tools, which we also do at Chainstack. Um, basically just trying to do everything that we can to primarily and the underlying goal of all of this is to increase developer adoption. That's at the center of everything that we do. It's to increase developer adoption and thus increase revenue. And that's kind of the, the, the seed that you're planting there, right? And increasing developer adoption happens through a lot of ways. It's not just developer experience. Developer experience is one part um, that is hands-on with developers, hands-on with tools, hands-on with content, right? And then of course you have sales and marketing and all these things have the same goal ultimately, of, especially in a, an organization like Chainstack of onboarding developers. But the interesting thing with everything that I just said, the kind of tangent that I went on there, is that if you ask the same question to three other organizations or five other organizations and you compare what they tell you versus what I just told you, then they will give you a polar answer. They'll say something opposite. They'll say, oh, our developer relations guys are marketing guys. Yeah, they just, they create uh, promotional material and uh, infographics that we post on our Twitter and that's all they do, right? They just like pump out content. Or some of them will say, oh, but they just write documentation and update our SDKs, right? Oh, you know, they, they just, we all they do is they just fly out to events and uh, sit at our booths and talk to people. I mean, and you know, these, these are all different applications of developer relations. So that's the interesting part about this role that, that I think Ake, you were mentioning earlier is that, you know, developer relations is an extremely, uh, or not, not developer relations, developer experience as, as a, as a, a team is changes a lot. It's very flexible depending on the organization that you're applying it to. Right. Because I mean, ultimately what you're getting at a base is just people who are technical that also can, that happen to be able to communicate and, and create content. Right. So, well, you have this as a base. Well, how do you apply it now? Right. So it depends. Are you a protocol like Avalanche? You know, I, I talked to the Avalanche. I just talked to them. Uh, I talked to the Avalanche guys all the time. I was just messaging with them before this podcast, actually, um, doing some, you know, uh, developer quantification stuff and their developer relations role. And I, I met, uh, some of their guys out in uh, Denver earlier this year. And we were talking about it. We're like, I was like, what is, what do you guys do at Avalanche? What, what's uh, the developer relationship look like over there? And it's totally different to Chainstack because they're a totally different organization. They have a different product. They have different goals. So it was like a lot more documentation and a lot more like backend stuff versus a lot more front facing stuff like Chainstack. I'd say maybe, and uh, maybe a, you may have a different perspective on this, but I'd say probably seven or eight out of 10 of the things that we do. Like seven, 70 or eighty percent of what developer experience does is like front facing a chain stack, at least mostly. So it's like tools, that, stuff like that, um, content. You know, like the whole developer portal. That's all front facing stuff. Um, so this is our focus. But then, of course, like Avalanche is totally. You know, it's it's different. Um, and then a different organization will be maybe somewhere in the middle. I mean, so this is a big part of of developer experience, and th- I think that's why for us when we started. That's why it was difficult to define maybe because it was just like, well, developer relations is different everywhere. Um, so we're just going to do what works for now. And I, I think ultimately my, my general idea is that for any organization, if you're implementing developer relations or developer advocates, you know, developer experience as a team, it should all contribute to revenue. This is the underlying goal of everything. It should create revenue, create value, right? So, you know, don't shoehorn a developer relations role into a team that doesn't need it, right? So you don't want to create content for something that isn't directly onboarding developers or, you know, vice versa. It's all, all these different things. So um, value generation, revenue generation is the most important. And it happens through the vessel of content, Twitter spaces, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, the list goes on of different things that we do, um, including, of course, uh, building tools and stuff like that. Um, so I guess the other component of that, which I'll get into in a moment, um, is number one, KPI quantification. How does this work? It's a totally different piece of a conversation. That's something we spent months on this year, just like trying to figure out what what kind of, kind of KPIs work for developer relations, um, as well as kind of maybe defining some of those different terms. But before I hop into that, Ake, was there any uh, kind of key key thoughts on on my definition there? Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I agree with everything you said. Uh, perfectly put in there. Uh, some things I'd like to add though is front facing uh as you mentioned we do quite a bit of front facing which is i think adds more value and for you know based on conversations and just experience with the with the, you know with different developer experience developer relations developer advocates front facing is i think uh is where the in general in the world developer experience guys are less comfortable in general because everybody wants to 
be building stuff and building stuff is fun is 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 super fun it's super fun um but doing front facing things like you know hopping on calls with customers or talking to other guys or doing this and that is is uh in general it's <clears throat> more often the case of uh for developer experience team members being in a less comfortable zone than it is be, uh, being on the back end building stuff. And again, at the same time, it's where, you know, there is more value, uh, where there is more value. And also some of the back end stuff is uh, as developer experience team member, you, know, you can offload. If you can offload, uh, you can, you know, you, you, you might want to offload this to like the engineering guys who do this all day long. Uh, and then you can kind of, you know, uh, jot down the uh, general outline, the architecture of things, uh, and you know, may pass over to them to implement this. Uh, you know, because you're, I think, kind of being a, a multi-skill person, uh, you might, you might, you might figure out at some point that uh, this approach might be adding more value to the company. But also, uh, something else I wanted to mention. Uh, but uh, I think, ah, yeah, yeah. So it probably doesn't matter. Well, it does matter, but it doesn't matter as much where the developer experience, experience uh, team organization starts within your company, you know, what team it sprouts uh, from, as long as it does, right? You can start in marketing, you can start in sales, you can start in, in product, you can start in engineer, you can, start in, you can, you can even start in support, uh, but from there, it will find find its way, uh, you know, out out there. It's usually, uh, and and the person the person starting this, the person doing this is, is again usually has this uh, generalist kind of approach of being, you know, multi multi faceted kind of person who can do a lot of different things and who's also optimized for learning. I believe, uh, who's 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 naturally curious, who's always willing to you know to to go out of their way and out of their comfort zone as well. Uh, to do stuff uh, in, in in general you know has this uh, kind of curiosity and love for the you know for the things they you know build their build their attitude build their attitude um, and also I think I don't remember who uh, what the name of the person is but head of uh, I was at some point I was listening to the head of developer uh, experience um, at github uh, and he said some fun which is uh you know developer experience team it can uh a different can in different organizations or even within the company different timelines it can be like in different time periods and can be a part of product it can be part of engineering it can be part of marketing but from his experience uh he said that uh being part of marketing is where you get uh, almost unlimited budget so it's probably <laughs> It's probably you not know, where you can just be spending a lot of money on, on different things. So uh, it'd probably be the most fun. J just just putting it out there for people who are considering of where you know to to sprout their developer experience organization uh, and things to consider. Uh, and I was uh, also at this point uh, I want to give a quick shout out. I just remember to a couple of people I met in in, in Vietnam, uh, which is also a testament to. To how important this thing that that we're talking about uh, is, uh, because I remember them right now, which is I met uh, it, a lot of different BDs, uh, but two two BDs uh, I talked to. Uh, one was from LiFi, uh, and the other one was a head of a BD from Sub Wallet. Uh, that's S U B Wallet Sub Wallet. And, and LiFi Live that five, who is also our customer, and we're going to do things together. But I was so impressed with them being very, very technical, uh, understand what the product is about, and you know how to if you if you want to you know do like understand the infrastructure, how to build the business around this. And they were BD people. And in general, when you talk to BD people, you know, and I'm and I'm guilty of this because uh, you know we've talked to, to so many to so many people. At some point, uh, you just have this prejudice, you know, and kind of you profile them before, or even when you start talking, uh, you kind of shift into a different gear than you were talking to developers. 
in you know you talk in a certain way but halfway through a conversation when you figure out when you when you talk to person like uh li-fi or sub wallet and you understand they are very passionate about this, this thing that they do they are almost product guys they are almost almost engineering guys they are almost developer experience guys that that's when they stand out <clears throat> and then you immediately get impressed and you know i'm giving a shout out to them uh today so you know being naturally curious and being you know in uh, in, in 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 general spending your work time you know in a meaningful way in, in a way that you really like what you do and you really want to contribute not just you know chill for like watch youtube for five hours and then go you know go home it immediately uh puts you out there and uh and makes you makes you more valuable uh and then you're going to stand out uh and this is you know this is this is kind of intrinsic skill to all developer experience uh, people, right? You can't be similar to those BDs, uh, which stand out immediately, uh, which is, you know, you can be a BD or you can stand out uh, as a BD in a way that you just described, but you can't really be a developer experience person, right? Who doesn't stand out, <laughs> right? Uh, if you're a standout BG, that's kind of for developer experience person. That that's kind of the only way to, uh, to 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 do this. You can't kind of go through motions, right? You can't go through motions because uh, all these situations are unique, and you need to know all of this stuff. And if you don't know all the stuff, which a lot of times you won't, uh, you you need to you need to figure it out. Uh, uh, and there is in, in a lot in a lot of times nobody is kind of holding your hand, nobody is helping you, and because we are Web three. And open source, nobody even knows how to figure it out, right? Uh, outside, and you're just on your own in there, and this is, uh, and you, you get used to it, and you know that that's how you, you your only way to be a developer experience person is to be, you know, stand out is the way, right? Being able to stand out is, is the only way, unlike other roles. So yeah, that's my take. Yeah, yeah, I definitely agree. It's it's interesting um, that the the BD guys stood out to you. I, I agree with that. I think, you know, you, usually when I meet with people and people reach out to me on LinkedIn all the time, like, hey, you want to meet? And I'm, oh, I'm always like, yeah, sure, whatever. And every time I, I describe what we do, it's always like, you know, I'm just like, hi, oh, do you know what RPC knows? It's basically like the connection of the blockchain, you know, like super, super basic, like rudimentary stuff. But every once in a while, there's somebody that's like, oh, yeah, of course I know what that is. Yeah, yeah. And they're like, yeah, I use Alchemy and whatever, and like all these different services that, that are similar to Chainstack. And and um, I'm like, okay, they they know what they're talking about. They like know the kind of business that we're in in the industry that that we focus on. Um, and it's always refreshing to see that be, when you see some somebody that like takes the time to learn that and you know uh, contributes to that. But you know, it's interesting. That's those those are ex- exceptions, not the rule, right? So like, these are people that are sure. definitely not the standard for business development or sales or anything like that. So. To create a team of those exceptions, right? Create a team of, of these kind of individuals that meet that standard across the board of people that, that, you know, do BD and, and do sales and product and all, like all these different things kind of simultaneously with the technical knowledge and uh, leveraging all these different verticals of an organization to, you know, onboard developers. This is at its core. This is what developer experience is. This is what developer relations is. And this is why it's important. Um, and quickly before I kind of, uh, go on another quick tangent. I want to define briefly the difference between developer relations and developer advocates. And this is this is a big thing that I, I got to be honest, I didn't even realize until probably months after I started at Chainstack. I, it was something that I had to realize and, and kind of learn for myself. And I think even like as an organization, we had to realize you know, like, like what is the difference between developer relations and a developer advocate? Because if you think about the words and the title, they're very similar, right? Somebody that advocates for developers, somebody that builds relationships with developers, I mean, you know, these are, are very close terms and they're very close roles. Um, but the way that I see it personally, and I think at Chainstack, we've almost consolidated it uh, very closely into to almost the same role. The main difference at Chainstack is that developer advocates focus more on, uh, like technical writing and content creation in the like sense of, of highly technical articles and stuff like this, like things that we post in our documentation. Um, so it's like, they're a little bit more technical in the nature of what they do every day. And then developer relations for chain in specific, it's more like, it's, it's more outward facing than developer advocates. Is. It's more, uh, go out there and, and talk to developers and it's less like a uh, documentation and stuff like that. 
So I think at Chainsight, those are kind of the main differences. Is I'd say developer advocates are more technical in what they do day to day. Developer relations are more outward facing, um, a little bit more like uh, communicative in terms of you know uh, like brand representation. And I think across the board, this usually applies. So, and but it's funny though. I, I I've actually been asked recently by some organizations that say, "Hey, can you review this um, this job that we're posting for developer relations? We want to uh, make sure that it's it's like the right description. Can you give us your feedback as as a, as a DevRel guy?" And yeah, I'll read I'll read through the job description and I say, "Okay, you know, I see some of these guys and." Because they're they're trying to put, they're trying to hire a dev role and they're trying to like figure out if they use the right terms and most of you guys aren't technical so I see I look at their the the PDF that they send me and I'm like yeah guys it, it, it probably shouldn't call it developer relations advocate evangelist <laughs> I mean <laughs> no, these are all very different terms uh, developer relations and developer advocate and, and developer evangelist I see as as three separate things usually sometimes they can overlap um, but in general I think I'll, you know a lot of times especially with like you know how new Web three is and all this stuff usually you'll see developer relations and developer advocacy um, intertwined as the same thing. Like I'd say probably eight out of 10 organizations you talk to, they're going to use the terms interchangeably. They're going to mean the same thing. But I think for the few organizations that don't, it's that that have the difference, these like terms differentiated, it'll follow that same rule. It'll be developer advocates are more technical and they focus more on, on, a documentation and, and more internal stuff usually. So like if you think about it, like from a semantic perspe- perspective, it's like developer advocates advocate for developers, which uh, means like potentially more internal th- technical stuff and then developer relations, relations infers, you know, building relations with developers. So if you just look at the words, it's kind of the intrinsic meaning, um, but most organizations won't do that. So I uh, just wanted to define that quickly as uh, I do develop relations. And then of course, David, who's usually with us is, is our uh, lead of developer advocates. So the, the thing I want to talk about to kind of shift, shift gears here a little bit is um, KPIs. So, okay, what we've done so far in the episode today is that we've defined what developer relations is. It's a team that combines a large skill set to uh, engage in technical conversations and engage with developers effectively to drive, to drive revenue. That's the, the shortest description possible of developer experience. And that's where it provides value to organizations, especially to organizations that deal with developers. So, okay, so we have this, and we understood this going into 2023, but one of our biggest challenges was, was okay, how do we quantify how much revenue is being brought in? You know, how do we quantify the actual impact? Because as a startup, you don't want, you know, a, a whole team of people that you're just like assuming is bringing in revenue because this is a challenging to justify expense wise. So like when it comes to, to startups stuff like this, everything is, is a cost benefit calculation. Everything that you do, everything that you do every day, every role that you have, every team that you have, it's how much does it cost and how much are we, are, are we getting in benefits? Um, how much are we getting in revenue effect? How much are we getting in like, uh, you know, potentially non-revenue effects. So what we want to do for developer experience is we wanted to focus on the revenue piece. And of course, when it comes to valuing teams, there are components other than pure revenue, but in kind of this high-speed environment, especially in Web3, this is what we wanted to focus on quantifying for developer experience. And specifically what we've done so far is, is for developer relations was thinking, okay, for developer relations, which at the time was, was more than just me, now it's just me. Um, it was how do we know how much money or how many developers a developer relations guy is bringing in? So this is a very hard, a hard question to answer because, you know, I mean, let's say I, I do in a given quarter, 24 pieces of content, 12 Twitter spaces, and I'm, you know, talking on Discord for three hours a day, four hours a day, I mean, whatever, like you, there's all these different numbers that you can go through, right? How do we know how many developers are actually checking out Chainstack and using Chainstack as a result of this direct community engagement, this content, these Twitter spaces that's at the center of, of developer relations at, at Chainstack and developer experience in general in a lot of cases. Okay, you know, so th- that was kind of the question to answer. It was a very difficult question. Uh, but at Chainstack, it was easier for us, and it, it, this is going to be harder for some organizations, but it was easier for us because we have a free plan called the developer plan, accurately named. It's just you can sign up for free and get free access to nodes, 3 million requests a month. A month that's super convenient, um, like very easy in, in just a few minutes. You can basically go from not having a node to launching an elastic node on one of 23 different chains, um, like literally in five minutes. So it's really cool. And this is where the majority of developers that are checking out Chainstack, that's where they go to, right? They sign up for a free developer plan. So this is, we were like, okay, we can track this, but now you run into another problem, right? We say, okay, well, if we want to look at 
the number of developer plan signups at Chainstack, you know, well, how do we know which of those signups are from developer relations? Right? Some of these are just going to be naturally like people finding Chainstack and some of these are going to be from marketing and some of these are just going to be like, you know, uh, SEO. And I mean, there's, there's a variety of things that impact the number of people that sign up to the free plan. So it's like, well, this is, this is a big problem. So long story short, I won't kind of get too, too, uh, uh, deep into the math, but, uh, what we created was a model. I call it the uh, developer relations ROI model, uh, you know, return on investment, uh, that essentially outlines a way that you can calculate within, um, you know, software as a service companies, platform as a service companies, uh, a way to say, well, these are the number of signups that we had total for, in this case, the developer plan. And this is how much approximately that a developer relations, a developer relations person contributed to it. And then we can say, oh, you know, okay, this developer relations guy had, uh, a 10% impact or a 5% impact on our number of developers that we had sign up this quarter right, or this month, or whatever. Right. So this is, this is kind of the way that, that we went about it. And this is from my understanding, a problem that a lot of organizations are still facing in terms of answering that question. How do we measure KPIs? Um, so if, if any organizations are, are listening to the podcast today, then that's, <laughs> there's your answer. It's, it's, it, For sure. you know, the math can get a little bit complicated in terms of like, it actually, you know, one of our previous podcasts, I think it was episode four, we went into a website that I made called, uh, developers.ethanfrancis.app, which maybe I won't leak it to get to into the methodology of how it works here, but that fits very closely with the way that we quantify developer relations. That was, that, that website was actually originally created for the purpose of, serving as a basis for KPIs and for um, approximating impact and stuff like that within Chainstack. So, you know, cool stuff like that. Um, but that was that was our solution to the the developer experience problem. And at Chainstack, developer experience in general has been uh, kind of a long going, you know, mission of, of trying to figure out what works. Um, and it's been, I mean, it's been a lot of faff going, <laughs> right, right. At, at the core of it. Um, it's, you know, let's try this. And it, it wasn't even until I'd say maybe, maybe it was December until developer relations was even a part of developer experience. We we're still part of sales until right. um, maybe I'd say maybe it was Turkey or something, something like that right. around that time. Um, so, you know, this was a big journey for us. It's been over a year that we've been, you know, for on the developer relations side, especially it's been like, this is what we're going to do. This is how we edit it. And, you know, this is, I mean, this is at the core of FAFOing just on a different level. You know, FAFOing usually is, is thought of as like, like coding things. But in this case, it was ironing out a role for the organization that after a year of refinement, we now know exactly where this fits in, what this actually means, uh, defining all these terms and, and then finding ways to quantify the value, which if anybody is listening that wants to do develop relations or uh, is thinking about adding developer relations to their organization, those are the components of what you need to define for you. It's going to differ for every organization, whatever you're building, right? Number one is defining what is developer relations for you, or we can just use developer experience as a blanket term. What does developer experience mean for you? What do you want out of it? And how are you going to leverage those that skill set that developer relations bring brings that we talked about today? And number two, it's you know how does that going to fit into your organization? What kind of responsibilities and all this stuff? Uh, but I think most importantly, it's going to say, well, what do we want revenue-wise and how do we quantify that? Right? How do we say, you know, th this team is bringing in this, this much? And then once you can answer these three questions, right, what do we want from them? Uh, how do we want them to fit into the organization? And how do we quantify the value that they bring? Now you have a developer experience team that works and that is refined, that isn't all over the place. Um, and this is, this is uh, uh, I think that we've accomplished that. I'm, I'm proud of the fact that we have gotten to that place after, of course, a very long time of fast -filling. Um, but I think it was a pretty interesting journey. Um, and that's kind of, you know, the, uh, the point that we're at today, uh, but I, I don't know, Ake, anything that you wanted to uh, add to that? No, not really. It's, it's a very, yeah, it's a very good overview of the South of the And uh, I think the developer experience is, you know, this is the ex exactly the builder mindset that the guys on the developer experience team should have, right. And, and always have building or, you know, from tools to, to the organization itself, to the role itself, right. And also, who else would be able to, to, to do both things, you know, is, is just one person. Like uh, processes and the the analytical platform to support this as well, right, from the ground up. Like the uh, the developer's dashboard that you have. Uh, yeah, so it's, uh, that's, that's kind of what the developer experience is. Yeah, it was a, it's a definitely an interesting role. 
Um, I recommend that, and you know, on the the crypto jobs list interview that you know I did definitely, and like I said at the beginning, watch it. It's it's super good. They did a yep. great job editing it. Um, it wasn't as as clean cut as <laughs> as the video makes it. It was lots of just you know talking for a very long time, but it's they edited it up super nice. It's very engaging to to, to listen to. There's not a lot of like empty space, um, so definitely recommend checking that out. And I think for a lot of people, developer relations is. Or developer experience in general is like, well, you know, a lot of people want to do it eventually as like a career. And it's something that the people generally like strive towards. Um, and I always think it's, it's an interesting starting point because for a lot of people, the idea of being an engineer, right? And like going into full-time engineering isn't attractive. It's like, well, I don't want to be doing GitHub pull requests all day. That's just not something that's interesting to me. But they, but they enjoy coding, right? They enjoy building things and they enjoy the process, the, the builder's process, like you mentioned. Um, but then at the same time, they're also like, well, I, I also enjoy creating content and like writing blog posts and stuff like that. And if that's you, if, if that's, you know, if, if that's something that, that you feel aligned with, then developer experience is probably, uh, the, the team that you should look at in terms of like globally throughout web three. Um, so anyways, yeah, it's, it's a super interesting topic. It's been, uh, you know, lots of uh, thought put into, um, how we format this and, and most importantly, how we answer the kind of the, the overlying question here, which is what is developer experience? And I, I think a lot of people are still working on, on answering that. Um, but I think that that was kind of the main topic for today. Um, Ake, was there anything else that you wanted to, to cover right. here before we start to wrap it up? No, not really. Yeah. I think it's a good one. It's a good one. Perfect. Sounds good. Well, again, um, thank you everybody for listening. Um, this was episode six of Fafo and Chill, where we talk about the nature of developer experience and how it started at Chainstack. We post these every single week where we dive into different parts of Web3, the tools that we're building, the different technologies that we're exploring, etc. So definitely make sure to catch us every Friday. Uh, I'm not sure what time we post it, but at some point in the morning on Friday, uh, you can catch it here on YouTube on the Chainstack YouTube channel. 